Hello YouTube, Chrissyosity here. I'm going to be doing my Q&A video. I'm just going to go down the line and I'm going to sort of do it just spitballing as I go, ranting, raving, whatever. Hopefully it will go well. We will see. Thanks. So the first one here is Jordan Bird. Hi. And he says, in your experience, what is the most effective tool in counter arguing a certain point? For example, humor, politeness, hard facts, etc. Well, I think you should have the facts with you. I think you should have them to sort of ground your own argument and to keep yourself honest and solid. But the truth is, I don't find that that really convinces people very well as much as you might hope it would. How it usually goes with me is I make an assertion and I back it up with something and people just find ways to talk around it if it goes against their narrative. So as far as what really is effective, I think it sort of depends. I think some people will respond well to humor and some people won't. Some people seem to put a high premium on politeness and other people can be very rude and they don't really care if you're rude. So I think you need to be a little bit flexible in your approach with people and just do the best you can to be, stay logical and stay honest with yourself. Um, right now, it's funny, I was having a Twitter argument with somebody and they really pissed me off. And so I just kind of said, I can't even talk to you anymore because it's just pissing me off. So I try to be honest with people and that's that's all I've really got. That's about it. I'm sorry if that's not a very great answer. All right. Thank you. So Iron Bowman. Here are my questions. Which one of the anti-SJWs is the worst or most evil? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I, <laughs> in my opinion, I guess the people I don't like, well, Probably Paul E. Lamb, I think, would be Paul E. Lamb. Millennial Woes creeps me out. Any of the really, really just scary ones to me, they're the ones that, I, I don't know, some of the things they've said, and mm, now that I'm thinking about it, who is that guy? His name is Paul something? I don't know. The one who said that he would basically walk over a woman being raped and not care or something to that effect. So when they get to that point, I figure we've really lost some important humanity pieces. We've just, just gone beyond what should be, right? So that, I guess, is probably when you are at that point, that's probably the worst point you can be at where you're just like, oh my goodness, this person can't even have the common decency to pretend to have common decency anymore, right? That's just me, though. Which anti-SJW do you th believe is the least awful? Um, well, I have a couple friends. Um, you know, No More Dogma. He's very nice, really. And I have a couple, you know, I have a few other anti-SJW friends. I guess it's hard because I, I never know who really actually says that they are an anti-SJW. So, but I'm pretty sure that No More Dogma does. And he is my friend. I'm not sure if Rin Michaelis does or doesn't identify that way. She's also wonderful. She's a great YouTuber. So other than that, I'm not sure off the top of my head. By the way, do you watch anime? Sometimes. Uh, if so, what are your favorites and least favorite? I tend to like the movies, and I tend to be really bad with movie titles, remembering what the heck they are. Uh, <laughs> but Spirited Away, of course, is one of, not just one of the best anime movies, but it's just one of, it's a great movie, so just in general.
So have I played Shadow of the Colossus? I have not, actually. Maybe I should, though. All right, now let's go down. Nada Smith, girl, love your stuff. Well, I love you, too. My questions are, have you ever experienced sleep paralysis, lucid dreaming, or exploding head syndrome? Uh, I don't think exploding head syndrome, though I haven't heard of that. But yes, sleep, par sleep paralysis and lucid dreaming were actually a problem for me for a long time. I also did do some sleepwalking. I, I used to have a lot of problems with those sorts of things. So very frightening, very frightening stuff at times. And I still have very, um, like, I, I tend to remember my dreams. They're very colorful to me. Like, I don't, I tend to have very vivid dreams that I can remember well. So have I ever heard of shadow people? I've heard of them. I don't know much about them. Have I ever seen one? No. Have you ever experienced something out of the ordinary? Certainly. A few things I've had. I think I've talked about some of these sorts of things before, but I've had like visions or profound spiritual experiences. What do I think of dark matter? Well, I don't know. I've never considered having an opinion on it. I think it's interesting. I think a lot of the sort of those sorts of things are, are interesting. What do you think about the idea that certain things we consider supernatural might be natural, if you know what I mean? I do know what you mean. I, I think I know what you mean, I should say. I believe what you mean is that sometimes things may appear to be supernatural because we haven't discovered the natural rationale for them yet. We haven't figured out what they really are. And, you know, it's entirely possible. So that's good. Do I believe in life after death? <sighs> <clears throat> no, but I've decided not to spend a lot of time worrying about it. I, If I'm wrong, I will find out. So there you go. And will you answer all of my questions? Apparently I just did. <laughs> all right, I hope that answers something. Thanks. Now we have Glacky13. Funny because I'm going to uh, unsub, but if you could get around to it, then why your little world equals I just saw you defend shoe on head and being a douche to a feminist for calling her a two-faced liar. Um, I know what you mean. I don't believe I was being a douche to the feminist. I hope not. I, it wasn't my intention to, to be that way. Shoe on head, for those who don't know, she comes and she watches feminist videos and she occasionally comments on them. She's commented on mine on demotivator opinions and yes while I always give her a hard time and I did on this thread too sort of challenged her on some of the videos that she has done on trans issues because I think that she propagated some untrue things and I don't think that that was a good thing for her to do. I think I put I worded it much better in the comment. I could go grab it but I can't be bothered actually. But yes I think that she has made some videos and said some things that I disagree with and I called her out on that but hopefully politely with some sort of base of respect because you know as difficult as it is I, I think it's useful to try to at least start from a position of respect. It will certainly go down from there if uh, my experience is any <laughs> way of looking at it, but it's starting well is good. Why do you comment content creators think so much of each other? <sighs> well, I guess there is, I guess there is a sort of professional respect kind of for other content creators. I, I don't think so much of other people just because they make YouTube content, but at least I have some basis of understanding some of the things that are involved in it, you know, and I, I have a certain respect for anybody who's willing to put their opinions and their point of view out in the world or their creative selves, because it takes you know, I'm not claiming it takes uh, gargantuan amounts of courage, but it takes some. I I think you're talking about something that a lot of people in the social justice world struggle with. And I'll, I'll talk about the, the Twitter exchange I was having before that I got very upset about. And it was because 
there was that bus that was going around New York and it was, it had things about trans boys are boys and girls are girls and we're freedom of speech bus. So, and it got vandalized. I posted something saying, I want to say the 10th, the 9th or 10th trans person was just recently, her name was Alfonza Watson. She was shot in Baltimore um, and was pronounced dead. So she's the eighth trans woman of, of color reported killed so far in 2017. This is just an ongoing problem. And so I sort of said on Twitter, you know, fuck your bus. You don't care about, you care about this big metal thing, but you don't care about Alfonso Watson. You don't care about all the other people that have died. And somebody came predictably to sit and argue with me about it and say, well, you have to see, you know, you have to take all the numbers of people and the exact population and do the percentage and then figure out, you know, based on that, whether you have a real problem or not. And I said, well, all hate crimes are problems. And I should say that Alfonso Watson, they haven't solved this case yet. It's an ongoing case. So I don't want to assume that it was a hate crime, though I, like I said, there have been quite a few. Um, it's just been a rising problem. So I got this guy and he's doing the whole <laughs> and I just, I feel this anger, right? I feel like this person is just, just riding roughshod over, over how you should feel about hate crimes, I guess, because this, these are people, people being murdered for who they are, right? And that's not okay. And I don't care what the percentage is versus the larger population versus... It's just staggering to me that somebody would sit there and go, well, I don't know. Well, actually. And so I feel this fury and I ended up literally saying to this guy, I can't. I can't argue about this with you because I have only so much faith in humanity left and you're you're taking what tiny little bit is left there away from me so i just can't do it right now maybe later i can have this argument in a very nice way but not today i know i'm totally rambling aren't i i guess my point is what we talk about in the social justice community is things that we feel very strongly about i can debate certain things with you and i can we can talk about implementing different strategies or how to look at things or, or how to fix problems or, you know, that sort of thing. But I can't debate with you whether the murder of transgender people is a problem. I can't debate that. I, I can't. It's not something like there's there's nothing in me that even allows that to be something I'm going to sit around and go, well, let's think about that and we can uh, do some math. I'll go get my, you know, fuck you. Fuck you. That's all I can say. <laughs> and it's not necessarily the most helpful way to approach an argument, but there it is. At the same time, I want to reach out and I want other people to understand my point of view and I want people to um, I don't want to let people down by not having the argument, right? So not that my arguing with some idiot on Twitter is going to save anybody, but if I can progress the conversation forward even a little bit, if I can do my little part to to sort of push this forward and to sort of push the progressive vision forward and to get more people on board with it, and enough people are doing that, then maybe that can help. In any case, it's the best thing I've got going. But in order to do that, I have to somewhat be nice to people. <sighs> Does that make sense? I don't know. It's something I struggle with. But thanks for the question. Have a good one. Scott Pronta. Do you play any video games? Yes, I do. So which ones are your favorite? Congrats on hitting 2000. Thank you. Um, let's see. I like RPGs, I like puzzle games, I like I, I like Minecraft. My kids play that. I played Warcraft, World of Warcraft, I should say, for a few years there, probably a little too much. So <laughs> I've had to sort of back away from that. But yeah, I mean, I've been playing video games since 
the kid two doors down from me got the first Atari in the neighborhood. So, yeah, I do like them. And I don't play them as much anymore because I do tend to get overly focused on them and then find me hours later going, <laughs> okay, uh, I'll go to the bathroom in another 20 minutes. It's okay. It's okay. I can hold it. And so that's not good. So I'm a mom. I have to be, got to be on my game. So got to put it to the side for a little bit. All right. AC McKenna. What do you think drives anti-SJWs? Depends on the one. What motivates them to argue so passionately against social justice issues? For example, another guy in comment section posted only feminism is shit, and I cannot imagine what even goes on in the head of someone like that to click onto the video of someone whose content they know they won't enjoy and not even try to persuade or listen. Well, that person is um, not coming from a healthy place. I want to give the benefit of the doubt to people that not everyone is like that though and and hope unfortunately i can understand being concerned about tactics and i can understand being concerned about different types of implementation it is very hard for me to understand people who just shut down the conversation about their fellow human beings being treated decently. Like, I just don't get that. That that one's difficult, and it's harder for me to understand where they're coming from. <sighs> and actually, I have right below is Yazaniko, who... Any and all thoughts about anti-fem women, cis, trans, everyone? I know I have tons of thoughts, but I want to listen to yours. Oh, okay. Um, so that sort of feeds into it. Some people... I, I think it's different for everybody. Well, I... I think that there are at least different categories, let's put it that way. So I think there are some people who, for instance, women who just haven't had certain kinds of experiences at, or, you know, people who have genuine privilege and they really don't see it. Like they have no experience, they don't have a frame of reference for it. So there is actually a word for it that I'm going to forget because I forget names of things. And this is one of the reasons I try to script everything because otherwise, mind like a sieve. But there is a word that sort of says we take our particular point of view to be normal. We, we believe that our normal is the normal. Our point of view of the world is the normal one. Like we just, t that's how we see the rest of the world. And we often forget, no. Nah. It doesn't work that way. What seems to be just common sense and normal everyday living to us may be completely, completely, completely different from somebody living a couple of states over or in a different socioeconomic background or a different racial background or different culture. They may see the same thing completely differently. And so trying to have a little empathy for people that you maybe don't understand and don't relate to can be difficult. I think some people, the cis people, women, trans, I think that there are some people that do internalize, you know, the sort of misogynist and dark attitudes that people have. If they've been raised in a certain way, if you've been raised, say, in a religion that considers women to be lesser than men, and you've been taught from the time you were diaper age that this is what God wants, this is the way the world was created. This is the whole intention. This was the whole plan the whole time. You're supposed to be straight. You're supposed to be a good little girl and a good little boy. And you're not supposed to be anything else than that. And you're supposed to do what God says you're supposed to do in this book that I have over here. If that's what you've been raised with, that's a tough thing to break free from. And that's just one example of how you could sort of develop internalized misogyny, internalized these other racist or transphobic attitudes, especially when you're a kid and you don't have defenses going against that. You have got nothing that's going to fight that back. You're just like, oh, mommy, daddy says this. It must be true, right? So that's just a couple of examples. I think that there are others. I think sometimes people just realize there's some good stuff in it for you. If you're willing to go along and, and feed into other people's biases, they're willing to go and say, yep, that's cool. <laughs> You know, they're going to give you money. They're going to give you attention. So I think, and, and these things can all work together as well. Learn social justice. 
What's your fave book on social justice? My favorite book on social justice... I don't know. I, uh... Carolyn Forche's poetry. I want to say that's my favorite. Or Lucille Clifton. Her poetry. Gwendolyn Brooks. When I think of my favorite books on social justice, they are probably poetry books. Which, prior to you asking that, I would not have really thought about that. That's what I'm going to say. I can give you specific titles for the books, but again, I suck at titles. If there's one thing that's going to be clear by the end of this, it's that I can't remember the names of things. There you go. Whew. Daniel Jones. If you could change just one thing about the world, what would it be? Ooh. Well, I'd probably want to make the world a little more friendly to itself, you know, a little more eco-friendly. I think that we need a, a better, cleaner world. If you can go back and offer your teenage self one piece of advice, what would it be? Yeah, it just, just muscle through it, because nothing is as bad as being a teenager. <laughs> Ah, uh, where does your sadness come from? Apparently chemical imbalances in my head and also from, I think it's a sad life, don't you? Sometimes? I mean, there's a lot of happy and a lot of joy, so. But they're sad and you're gonna go through it, so there you are. Jordan P. Hi, Chrissyosity, how are you? I'm good. My question is, what's your favorite kind of music and favorite musicians or bands? Hmm, favorite kind? I like so many different kinds of music and so many different musicians and bands. That's very difficult to say. I'll say this. My favorite musical experiences have been in sort of smaller groups. Uh, not, not groups, like small venues of live music. That's what I like the best. That's what I enjoy the most. Like, and it can be folk music, it can be rock music, it can be whatever. But like being with other people, chilling out and listening to people live who are really good. But not necessarily so much being in a big stadium listening to, the, to that. Because, you know, it's, that's a bit crowded. I get nervous in crowds that big. But just like a place that's a little more chill, that's my zone. Like, I could do that all day long. Right. I, I've always hung out with a lot of musicians. I've always known a lot of musicians, so that's kind of my thing. But yeah, I don't... Uh, stylistically, a wide variety of styles appeal to me. And I, I couldn't pick my favorite musician or bands, though I like women that rock. I, I do like to hear... But that's not all I like. I like everything. <laughs> well, not everything, but a lot of things. Let's see. Um, Nick Bayless, you are asking me about something here that I would have to go do some research for, so I'll just answer this comment later to you directly. Sorry. Um, let's see. Cody Kraus, what are your thoughts on the French presidential candidate? Emmanuel Macron and his movement on March. I don't know enough about it. I'm no fan of uh, Marine Le Pen. <laughs> I know that. So if, she, if he's going to beat her, I'm all for that. But I don't know enough about the movement to really speak accurately on it. If you opposed the agenda of Trump, would it make much more sense to vote for Macron? Noting that whether you like him or not, he's a much better and more qualified candidate. Well, yeah, I think I would not vote for Le Pen myself. Who's my favorite anti-SJW? I think I answered that. You know, I like uh, No More Dogma. I like Rin Michaelis. I like, again, Positive Improvements. Who's that Scarecrow guy? Is it Vengeful Scarecrow? Um, I like, oh God, I can't remember her name. She's the one that has the avatar that's like um, the Day of the Dead makeup girl avatar. I, I can't remember her name. Oh. Then there's uh, Gina. Is she really anti-SJW? I don't think so. And I also don't think infidel Emma is. But if they were, if they count as that, then I would 
I would put them in that boat too of favorite. Anyway, Kane Slayer. Like Kingslayer, but different. <laughs> See, I remembered. What first got you into social justice? I'm sure it's in one of your earlier videos. There's a lot of them. Um, yeah, I can't remember if it is or isn't, but yeah, history and books. Books and history, books about history. Uh, when I was a kid, I had a series of books. They were called uh, value, I called them the value books. I don't know what the series was called, but it was like the value of patience and the value of this and the value of courage or whatever. And each book covered one historical figure and oh, I, I just loved them. And you know, I wanted to be Harriet Tubman and I wanted to be Elizabeth Fry and Jane Addams and Margaret Mead that were just like out there and they were doing work and they were fighting the good fight and doing what was right. So I don't know, I always, I always sort of related to that. I don't know, maybe it was the Wonder Woman underoos. I can't tell you, but I've just always had a passion for wanting, wanting to make the world a better place. And I think when you read about history, I think when you read about the kinds of things, even if you read like the fiction of people a hundred years ago, 200 years ago, I think it's amazing to see how much the world has changed and to really think about, my God, people really fought to make the world such a different place now than it was back then. All these sort of amazing injustices and incredible ways that people had of thinking about people, you know, uh, that we don't even we don't even process how different it really was. You know, I remember just recently reading Ian Fleming, some of his books. He wrote the uh, Bond series of books, and he was so racist. <laughs> <laughs> he was racist in a way that's almost like weirdly racist. Like he would sort of racially profile you down to your zip code, you know, it was like, it's very, and he had all kinds of like really weird Southern French people have a better sense of smell. I, I, I'm just pulling that out of my head, but you know, every little thing like that. And, but that was how they really thought back in those days, they had such like this whole movement based around just racism. That was the world was so built and created on this racist model, right? You can see that in almost any like 18th, 19th century, early 20th century, you can really see how they had things sort of stratified in their world. So this is starting to go on very long i don't know i can't tell you how long we've been doing this so <laughs> if it's too long i feel bad let's see small seal 17 says does your family have pets yes we have a cat a black cat named mage do i have an opinion about communism oh that's gonna be too long for this video because we're we've been going on for a long time and there was Adam Rainstopper. I really wanted to get to him. Um, and he was talking about rape by deception, which, oh boy, that's a whole other question. Um, and I, I agree with him. He's going to say, the subject is what I call rape by deception. And while I'm told by self-identified feminists that I'm in the extreme radical minority, I think my position on this is actually quite obvious. So we're talking about when a person commits fraud, when we're talking about rape by deception, rape by fraud, um, we're talking, and this is against the law in places in the United States right now, for instance, in Tennessee, I think it was, there was recently, not that recently, but there was a case where a man sort of convinced these women that he was their boyfriend, either calling them or writing them notes. I can't remember exactly the story um, and saying, you know, this is my fantasy that you would be tied, you know, blindfolded and naked on a bed and I would just come in and, and have sex with you. And he did that and he ended up doing time for rape because that was rape by fraud, rape by deception. And there are other cases that are not quite like that, and I don't think they're in the United States, but they're more like, let's say you told somebody that you were a single person when in fact you were a married person and had children 
and therefore this deception caused a person who otherwise would not have slept with you to sleep with you. And that I'm, I don't know that I would call, that one's a trickier one, right? Um, Prof MTH, I want to say, did a really good video on this and I will probably link that because when I was doing my GAD SAD videos, I had to look into this, so that's why I know something about it. But it's it's an interesting question. It's sort of, and I think what Prof, is it Prof MTH, Prof TMH? I don't remember. His point was like, if it's fraud, if you're going to be concerned about somebody taking your money by fraud or somebody taking your property by fraud, why wouldn't you be also worried about your bodily integrity? And I get that, but I also get that it's, uh, it's a tough one, right? Because most of us are not as completely upfront with people that we are attracted to as we could be. And that's a hard thing to sort of legislate. And it's like, it's really tough. So it's, that's a much tougher question. But yes, I would say in the case of something like the Tennessee thing, I would definitely call that rape. I'm not as sure about about the other sort of thing. While I'm in favor of informed consent and I understand the arguments, I'm just not sure that it's a good idea to have that degree of legislation into people's private sexual lives. I don't know if you can do it. I'm not sure if it's a good idea to do it. So that would be kind of my answer. And oh my goodness, now we've gotten through. Yay! I am sorry I rambled on. All right, you can tell I'm tired. I'm tired. But that's me. I'm so glad you stuck with me. Thank you. I appreciate it. And this has been Chrissyosity. You know you liked it. So thumbs up. And you know you want more. So subscribe. Bye.